So um, welcome everyone to this THE special for Dry Lab for Real Science. We're delighted to have two presentations today from individuals who were shortlisted for the Times Higher Most Innovative Teacher of the Year Award. Uh, we're going to kick off with Cass Seeds, who, as you can see on the screen, is the Programme Lead for Wildlife and Conservation at Scotland Rural College. Um, so Cass, I know you have to dash off straight yeah. after, so uh, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Super, thank you. And thank you so much uh, for the invitation. I hope the room I'm sat in is not too echoey. Um, I'm actually down at our Dumfries campus at the moment, um, and uh, we have some fairly terrible weather as well. So I'm hoping that we won't be plagued by the power outages. So if I suddenly disappear, you know where I've gone. Um, I'll probably be talking to myself for, for a while. <laughs> uh, I'm delighted uh, to have the opportunity to, to talk to you about uh, my experiences in teaching um, and some of the things I've been involved in. I was very surprised by the uh, THE nomination. I was delighted by it. Um, but I do love to experiment and um, create with my, with my teaching. And I guess the last couple of years have really stretched this beyond anything I could uh, have imagined in, in respect to uh, the title of the presentation here in terms of dealing with lockdown. And, uh, and that really has amplified things. Um, as I said, uh, as, as Nigel said, I'm a programme leader for wildlife and conservation uh, management at Scotland's Rural College. Um, I teach a really wide range of students from our kind of FE students on national certificates all the way up to uh, master's level students as well. Um, so I have I've been teaching for about 10 years altogether. Um, and it's been a brilliant uh, journey thus far. Um, so yeah, I'm delighted to share a little bit about some of the things I did uh, and, and some of the things that I uh, I played with because really the subject of my, kind of the topic of my sort of presentation with you this afternoon is, is really looking at experimentation of teaching, um, of teaching kind of uh, techniques and really looking at how some of the technologies can enhance our, our delivery. And that's really where all this came from, I think. Um, so I'm absolutely certain that um, COVID uh, amplified the digital agenda, but um, for organisations like mine, particularly um, the, the the sort of the work that I've been doing uh, on the wildlife and conservation management degree, the the kind of technology enhanced uh, learning had started a little bit before then, and I've always really been sort of clear in my role as a as a teacher first, and latterly a program leader that. Um, Technology is is central to, um, to you know to, to teaching, um, and increasingly central to, uh, to 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 the industry that our graduates are heading into. Um, and yes, we still go out and uh, look around the woodland floor. Uh, with our sort of hand lenses for, for 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 the mini beasts and the invertebrates of the uh, of the woodland floor, but we also um, you know will fly drones over uh, landscapes to to gain a, an insight into habitat connectivity and uh, use metagenomics for uh, understanding freshwater environments, for example. So technology is now a key part of our graduates' landscape. Um, but I think as well the important thing for me was that. Technology should be a tool, um, and, and really that was central to some of the innovations that I want to talk to you about. Um, I won't call them innovations because I don't, I don't actually think they're innovations. Maybe how we went, how we did things from a kind of perspective of, a, of our degree, perhaps. Um, so, yeah, my, my biggest, you know, clearly the biggest pivot point, like many of us, uh, was was the, was the sort of COVID, um, the, you know, as, as COVID news uh, broke um, and my pivot really centered on um, how I would get students out into the environments uh, while in lockdown. Um, as you can imagine, you need some access to wildlife um, and environments to study for our course. And I really do remember that kind of sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach as the reality uh, of what we were facing uh, dawned and how between the end of for us, term two and the start of term three, we would have to A, recover, B, develop and C, deliver. And I add recover in here purposefully because I really, you know, that another sort of principle of some of the work I've done over the last bit of time was about support and supporting um, students and supporting staff in, um, you know, dealing with this, this huge challenge. Um, and then now in kind of this new landscape, how we move forward as well. And we're all human, you know, we're all really aware of how kind of disruptive that point in time was um, and how overwhelming as a teacher it felt as we had to make this huge pivot. Um, 
And we, you know, we had to pivot and pivot we did. Um, we had modules like habitat management and classification and identification of living organisms. And, and these needed some form of delivery uh, to, 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 to try and support our students to the end of, uh, to the end of their programs. So I'm going to walk you through a couple of different things we did um, and, uh, and just, you know, explain some of the rationales um, and some of the motivations and some of the things that worked well and some of the things that didn't work well. Um, and, and hopefully uh, just share some experience and hope maybe, you know, ideas uh, may come from it. My first idea um, development, I'm not really quite sure what to call it, but was to try and um, resolve this immediate need of um, continuing on, not losing momentum on a module which should be happening in the field environment. Um, and so before we got really heavily into the kind of the lockdown scenario before restrictions on travel happened, uh, we all went out and furiously started um, gaining more footage and more sort of film and um, interpreted the sites that we took for granted, you know, the things that were in our immediate vicinity, even on our campuses. Um, you know, there was some question about whether we'd be able to get to them. Um, and so we, while we had this very small window and we sort of went through all of our sort of previous footage and everything, um, almost at that point as a bit of a security blanket, um, just sucking in data. Um, and, and thankfully, you know, we had the sort of back systems to, to deal with that as well. So in my head, I kind of had this idea that we couldn't stop. We were kind of in the middle of things. I wanted to try and kind of create some momentum. So I thought I'll try and create a sort of virtual field trip. Um, and, you know, if you'd have asked me five years ago would I have been teaching as a kind of almost like doing sort of tv type delivery I would never ever had said that, that would be my my life as a teacher uh, but there we are um, so I started to try and figure out how I could create a virtual field trip on a platform. Um, I kind of had a few sort of things to think about. Uh, I needed to uh, I needed to find something that was cheap uh, or free, um, even better, a small institute like ours, you know, you want to make sure you get a decent uh, value for money. Um, but also, I wanted something that was simple, and I've got a sort of ish behind that, um, and, and familiar. Um, and so, you know, something that I could maybe work with others. I didn't want to just necessarily sort of hold on to this kind of development on my own. So I use a couple of different sort of open access Google based uh, platforms and I settled ultimately on this one I did do another one and actually they've stopped running it it was a, a poly uh, program which allowed us to sort of stitch 360 footage together um, and now I'm kind of on the hunt for a new sort of VR thing uh, platform for that but uh, so this was you know the first kind of virtual field trip and there's lots of things I mean in reflection I suppose as practitioners we should always be reflecting on what we're doing there are lots of things that I would do differently but this was me in that moment in time uh, trying to create something that we could use um, so on the screen here you've got kind of the I'll try and um, share to it in, in just a second um, and we'll, we'll have a kind of quick walkthrough of one of the designs so this is a, a site in a, a Scottish Wildlife Trust reserve site um, and let me just see if I can get us to it come out of that and come into Google Earth and hopefully that is still sharing. Give, do give me a shout if yeah, it's it perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'll just go steady through this because it can. One of the things that, as a as a member of staff, I, these are so many things you don't even realise as soon as you start doing things like this. Is that when you're presenting this, um, just how people's kind of own systems at home handle the the kind of movement, but it's based on Google Earth platform and um, basically you're just using it as a bit of a sort of project base um, but it allowed me to um, create a kind of virtual visit to this reserve um, and we'll just gradually step through some of these screens so you can sort of see what I was doing. Um, you could always, you can embed images as well in it so I'll just take a gentle fly through. We'll wait for screens to refresh. So we could use 
tiny fraction of uh, street view. <laughs> this, this is the corner of the uh, of the reserve off a uh, single track. So I was so lucky that sort of we'd been through, but we can we can kind of stitch imagery into the the field trip. So the next image, just bear with me while it loads. Um, this is one of the first sort of areas of the of the reserve. It will just take a while for things to come up. And just a, you know, it's a piece of boggy ground. Um, and I was wanting to introduce the idea of managing this boggy area for some special species like the Scotch Arga. Um, and then we could add sort of imagery. We could add video footage to this. Um, we could have, so we had old footage of students doing bits and pieces of, of management. We had, you know, we were able to sort of stitch in links to other uh, organizations that were doing um, you know, varying sort of habitat management stuff um, and create this walk around. So this is an 11 stop tour of, of this nature reserve. Um, and, you know, in terms of, you know, in, ter in terms of uh, putting this together, it took a little bit of time to kind of sort of work out how to do it. But uh, once I'd kind of sucked in all the material, all the video content, um, was then able to build five virtual tours that kind of got us over that initial bump in the road um, that was the kind of really severe uh, lockdown period. If we just come back, uh, well, we'll go on to, a, uh, on to the next one. I've got just an, another piece. This will be a, a slide that I'll, I'll just flick through when we get there. But um, one of the things that I wanted to do at the, at the start of this project was to as I said, one of the rationale for it was to find something that was comfortable, familiar and sort of reasonably user friendly, because I think if you're going to do something as a almost as a sort of emergency sort of we've got to get something online that's straightforward, but still gives decent kind of access to information for your students, then it has to be something that you can roll out across a team of, of teachers. Um, so I was really pleased when only maybe a couple of weeks later, there was a, a, one of the uh, res research groups at the, at the, at the, at the college um, headed up by my head of department uh, said, oh, do you know what? I th thought this virtual tour could work really well for us. So they then created, and this hopefully won't take too long to load because if you don't sit on it for too long, it disappears. We'll maybe leave that running in the, in the background. Can't Google Earth, don't let me down now. It may have let me down. This is one of the things when you use technology, you can almost guarantee that at the point in time when it's the most important, it will fall over. And I guess that's one of the things that you have to get sort of come to terms with when you're, when you're working with this, this kind of stuff, it's not always gonna work. Um, so we'll, we'll, I'll show you a screenshot of it. Let's come to that and we'll go. Back into here. Oopsies, fatal error. So, where are we? Next one. So yeah. So this was the um, yeah. This was the uh, the sort of wider safari project that they used as a sort of on the basis of the the virtual field trip that I put together. Um, and this was a much bigger uh, program, and it had lots of different. Um, components to it. So we had sort of our peatland restoration research project. We collaborated on varying sort of climate change uh, uh, projects. We, we were looking at um, conserving the wet uh, sort of West Woodland kind of wet rainforest trees sort of habitats on the West coast of Scotland. And the Google map sort of virtual field trip gave a, a, a sort of platform to kind of uh, publicize the project, but also do it in a point in time when normally you would be doing lots of visits as part of your research outputs. And that just wasn't possible at the time. So it really, you know, beyond my classroom and my student experience, it was a, it was a nice thing to be able to kind of share with colleagues. Um, and within the organization, we had a kind of digital champions program to, 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 to sort of share these sort of practices that we were developing. So that was really nice. I was really pleased that it got sort of picked up and ran with in a, in a probably a bigger scale than I was doing in, in an immediate kind of module setting. <clears throat> and then another sort of aspect to my teaching was this kind of vlogging, um, which I use the term kind of <laughs> cautiously, um, but never kind of in my wildest dreams did I think that I would evolve from being a teacher in you know, a classroom and a field sort of work 
to being some sort of like web vlogger. I don't have my own YouTube channel just yet, but uh, you know, it's just, it was extraordinary how we sort of, how things sort of moved and the pace at which they moved. So as we were coming through the sort of tail end of the real the sort of lockdown, we were starting to bring students back onto campus. We were dealing with such a high in sort of variable of, of student attendance. Could they get there? Were they able to get there? Were they self-isolating? Were they isolating because of vulnerable groups and all that kind of thing that was going on? Um, and a lot of our work, particularly in years one and two, is very practical. Um, so again, how could we create that momentum of, of learning? Uh, and so I started to experiment with a GoPro. And so when I talk about experimenting, I think sort of confidence of trying these sort of technologies, I think, you know, strapping a GoPro to your chest is probably as, you know, it takes a wee bit of sort of confidence to do it. So this is me trying it out. I'll see if this video works. I'm just going down here to have a look. Good boy, Beans. Okay, so so that's me sort of at the weekend uh, taking the dogs for a walk with my GoPro, um, testing kind of how how good it was in the wind, how good the microphone picked up and stabilizing and all this, I suppose, come really naturally to to some groups, um, you know. But for me, I'd never I'd never put a GoPro on before. Um, but I thought, well, I, I I need to be able to sort of document and record. Um, to be able to kind of create a, a, an experience for students who can't get to us um, for whatever reason. Um, and so we started to mount chess cams and started to use that in our, in our practicals. Um, and it's a brilliant tool to capture, you know, data, you know, it's designed, the only thing I see, you know, people strapping it to them when they're mountain biking and stuff. It's a really good tool to be able to capture some movement and stabilize it without having to spend ages in editing. Because I'm not a video editor at all. Like, I don't have any experience of that. Um, so I needed something that would capture footage quite quickly and easily. Um, oops, that's going to play again. You don't want to see me walking my dogs again. Um, Another, uh, and so yeah, so sort of taking that, we sort of went to the field and um, we started recording the practical. So it was just a, a screen grab of, 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 of the, uh, the videos. Um, and then it's a bit big to put into this, but I was taking the videos um, and then, you know, sort of using them as um, records of the session, which actually weirdly, as soon as we started doing that, we started realizing that we'd um, kind of solved an age old problem of, um, you can see all the students with clipboards and notebooks, but um, they, they struggle sometimes um, with, with kind of dealing with practical work. They, th this group of students would be going off and looking um, at some of the sort of pitfall traps and bits and pieces we had out in the woodlands. And they find it really hard to kind of, um, when I'm doing my bit and talking about what we're doing and why we're doing it and getting them to ask and answer questions, um, sort of field notes and things like that seems to be um, more challenging these days. So in some respects, just like we now capture classrooms, this gave me an opportunity to capture the, the field work as well. And students were reporting in, in the kind of feedback um, mechanisms that they were benefiting from being able to go back to field work, which they hadn't been previously able to do. Um, and we were able to insert it into our kind of VLE. We use a Moodle, add interactive elements to it. Um, so we could make it more of sort of almost content as well. So it, it so certainly started growing arms and legs and, and we sort of uh, worked with it uh, more and more. So that's some of the kind of ideas of uh, some of the kind of stuff we were doing with, with more sort of teaching content. Oh, sorry, I keep forgetting that auto plays. Um, oops, sorry. The last little bit, um, I wouldn't say it was an innovation, maybe just pushing the boundaries of what I was comfortable with. I hit a roadblock again with being able to get students away from campus. I could bring students to my campus, but I couldn't get any sort of approval to take students away, couldn't get in a minibus. Again, these sound really straightforward things, but when you're delivering a really practical based program, ecology based sort of thing, you you know, you're you're suddenly faced with how do I do this? So, you know, one of the principles that I'm trying, you know, trying to sort of illustrate in this talk is that kind of creativity and experimenting. I had no idea when I put this teaching plan together that it was would work. So I was teaching a marine ecology session and I couldn't get the students to the beach to do that kind of classic rocky foreshore kind of demonstration. 
so I decided to bring the beach to them. Um, so I, I live in the Ayrshire coast, so I was able to safely get down and collect samples, and I created some sort of sort of environmental gradient. So I had buckets of, of uh, sort of invertebrates and seaweeds in representing the different zones of the shore, and I took it to the campus, and I got the students to um, rock pool in buckets. Um, which sounds so daft when I talk to a bunch of, uh, you know, colleagues like yourselves. But it, for me, it's about sharing that it's OK to experiment. It's OK to 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 put yourself into a vulnerable position. Um, you know, and the students, the feedback that these students have given me over the year, over the year or two about doing some of this stuff has enriched their experience. These are students who want to do outdoor practical learning um, at the different levels that we teach. So we didn't want to lose momentum so we kind of put ourselves out there and in this case we we took the beach to the campus another really big part i'm sure everybody experienced during um the, the kind of lockdowns was the the kind of isolation of students at home um and how we could continue to keep the community feeling um while students weren't on campus um and so here are just a couple of examples of the things that um we we, we put sort of into um, into our kind of nomination, I suppose. One of them um, was uh, looking at uh, wildlife camera traps. Um, so another, we, we do quite a lot of work already with wildlife cameras um, and we, we started to sort of do some online kind of tech sessions, a bit like I saw some wonderful things of um, craft sessions and, um, you know, just sitting and doing, we had a film night and we, we used a lot of TED talks in our film nights and just having sociable time that wasn't taught time so we did sort of unboxing of camera traps and we looked at how you could build your own camera traps if you wanted to and all of a sudden it started snowballing and we ended up with a group of students that caught the bug and really got uh in stuck into creating their own content so this is just a, a really just i just wanted to put it in because i just thought it was lovely um so hopefully you can hear it oh. Oh, yeah, it's playing. So that's just, I mean, just to sort of express, you know, how our students came in around the, some of the innovations that we put in around film night, about wildlife camera traps, what could we see in our own immediate environments, still maintaining that kind of enthusiasm for wildlife and seeing safely, obviously, within the parameters. Um, and it just ran and ran and ran. And we, it was amazing just the just how people got into it and the footage they got, but also the experience they were having. Um, and it was uh, nicely kind of related to what we were teaching as well, which was a complete fluke as well. Um, another one uh, is want to share with you was really again it comes back to this point about experimenting and make sort of the vulnerability of a team of people that we're trying to bring students together um, and enrich their experience so uh, probably your institution has maybe I don't know maybe a pet therapy with maybe part of the learning support team we have a pet therapy we have a, a, a poppy the springer spaniel who's here at the campus um, and again you know we couldn't get our sort of pet therapy sessions, you know, helping students deal with anxiety. So um, one of my colleagues, uh, Lucy, who um, lives with uh, alpacas uh, on her property, and um, she, again, this is just sort of the sort of thing that we were trying to build in the team, this kind of confidence to go and try something. So this is footage, uh, just very quickly, and I'll just flick through it, of our alpaca wellbeing sessions, or hug an alpaca. Um, and again, this just came from from, from just what can we do to to keep our students um, sort of positive and motivated and engaging with us and being confident online and doing stuff that didn't matter and all this kind of thing just to try and keep the experience as, as high as possible I'll just flick through this because it's a bit longer and I didn't have a chance to edit it but this is a kind of and it just shows you that it doesn't have to be perfect to have a great effect 
because it's in the field in the middle of Yorkshire. So the signal connection is really bad. So we use um, our alpacas for, um, they were part of alpaca trekking. So we put a head collar on them and take them for, <laughs> take them for a walk. And people would pay for that. You don't even ride them. You literally just walk them like a, a big dog, small horse um, around the field. So this, I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. So this guy here, this is Thanos. Okay, so that, those are the alpacas. And then um, a bit further on, so we're walking and filming. Going to the barn, and it's quite famous for losing connection in the barn. This is, oh, this is Mr. Bojangles. He was born a week ago. He was a And then just to finish off this little bit, you know, just... Yeah, um, it, and yeah, I'll catch you soon. So that was my very ham-fisted way of editing my way through a video that I couldn't quite get to. But in essence, we, you know, in that we, you know, from the kind of right back at the virtual field trip, going out and recording in front of cameras, embedding that into our teaching, kind of created this bubble where we could just have that ability just to, to experiment a little bit more with, with what we wanted to, you know, what we wanted to do with sort of student well-being. Um, and it didn't matter that, you know, from our students' perspective who were, were engaged in this session, it didn't matter that, the, you know, that it was a bit wobbly and it, it made you feel a bit seasick now and then. It was more about having an opportunity to socialise online, to, um, you know, to take, a, take a break from the sessions of teaching um, and, and just for staff to have the confidence to go out and, and do that as well. So we, Oops, I've done it again. So we use um, Sorry, our... Um, too many screens, that's the problem. So we... Oh, use... flipping heck. There we go. And the very last one, um, which I'm conscious of time, I, I, won't, um, I won't sort of uh, play the video, but this is another member of my team, Sally, who is an instructor. So she does a lot of work with our lower school level, uh, our FE groups. Um, and she wouldn't mind me saying that she faced a huge learning curve um, when we had to pivot to online teaching. Um, but what she lacked in technical kind of know-how, she really made up with enthusiasm uh, and duty of care to her students. Um, and she really did become the next sort of our own sort of David Attenborough. And, and this is a, was a clip of um, her filming um, a moth trapping session. And she was able to still engage students on a whole variety of wildlife surveying um, that they could do in their own gardens. Um, and she managed to keep our kind of ID modules running um, throughout the worst of the kind of lockdown from her uh, from her back garden, which for somebody who you know hadn't filmed herself teaching, hadn't really worked on uh, Moodle, and just supporting and being part of that kind of championing environment, I think was one of the things that I was really passionate about um, as we sort of navigated our way through the last two years. Hi. So, so to finally, to finish, um, I guess really uh, these are my sort of take sort of takeaway messages. For me, kind of the work that I've done in the last two years really focused on experimentation. And I guess, you know, you are going to be vulnerable when you when you put, you know, I feel vulnerable today putting videos into presentations and forgetting how to move the slides on. But actually, when you do that, your students are then viewing you, um, you know, visibly experimenting with the session. And they might think then that it's, you know, it's OK because things will go wrong and that's OK. And, it, and, you know, how can we expect our students to go outside of their comfort zones if we can't, you know, we're not maybe as comfortable getting out of our comfort zones? So in some respects, I think that is a core to the kind of work we've been doing in the last uh, few years. And that risk, set, risk taking is, is part of that. The, the, the kind of student centered experience, you know, trying to find out what would keep our students motivated through the long periods of isolation um, and being prepared to kind of try and help with crazy alpaca sessions and things like that. I think confidence really comes from trusting your students as well um, and developing bonds of dialogue um, and, 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 and that way, you know, you're trusting that, that if you fall, they will they are going to catch you. They are going to be there to accept that you're trying to put um, together content to, to, to benefit them. Because um, I think sometimes teaching can be a bit of a lonely place. And I think teaching when you're faced with an impossible challenge is even more the case. Um, and I think you know the students are a product of, of our innovation, you know, and they're a, they're, they're a catalyst as well for our innovation. And that kind of growth mindset, it, it sort of has a ripple down effect. We've, we've seen staff 
grow and experiment and, and use technologies that they wouldn't have used before. We've seen our students getting excited about um, the, the technology that's involved with, with, our, with our industry and our teaching. So I guess really at the end, I think one of the things uh, for me is that I would love to see more focus on how you know, technology enhanced teaching impacts the teacher, the practitioner, because you see a lot of sort of work done on how it affects the, the, the student experience. But, you know, we've, we have to find a way to, to, to work with these technologies and to, to support our colleagues. Um, so, yeah, I'm really, you know, really enthusiastic about looking more at how we, you know, what sort of systems work well for, for teachers and, and how we can really drive forward more sort of teaching innovations. So thank you very much for uh, listening to me. I hope it was uh, uh, interesting, entertaining, um, and a little bit of an insight into what I've been up to in the last couple of years. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kath. That's absolutely brilliant. Uh, I'm going to jump in with just a comment right at the start. I, lo I loved one of the things you said about putting yourself into a vulnerable position and being willing to fail. I think that's so important. Could you maybe give an example of some of the things that didn't go so well first off and how have you actually defined that so that they they do work the second or the third time you use them yeah um i didn't so the, definitely when i was using the virtual field trips I, I sort of alluded to the um it's more of just of an awareness a cognizance of not everybody is going to be operating in the same on the same kind of um network speed as you 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 know you really have to take your time so i you know, you had to change, I had to change kind of how long things would take me to do online. Um, and I had to learn that quite quickly. In my mind, you know, in my position of putting together the virtual field trip, it made sense to me, but I had to then also sort of convert that into how is this going to play from, from a, from a student side? How is it going to be utilized? You know, can they use it offline when I'm, you know, when I'm not showing it, uh, other things like uh, sort of video footage, um, I did, you know, I definitely found that um, we needed the GoPro, you know, I'm not plugging anything here, but we definitely needed something with a simple interface that we could click and go, basically, um, because anything else like digital SLRs and things, um, the how to make it stable enough when you're working with with kind of practical delivery. Um, so we we did trial all sorts of different things, um, and that again, not plugging anything here, but that was the best system for us. It just you know it's been well trialed with with you know the vlogging, the YouTube kind of scenarios, and it and it absolutely worked for for myself as well. Um, and I had things where I had experiences where um, you know. The uh, we had to put kind of extra tutorial sessions in if if students like I had one student in that group that were doing the beach work um, who um, was uh, um, is on the autistic spectrum um, and so an abstract concept which is having them in sort of visualize a holistic view of the world in three buckets of of seaweed that you know that was one of the biggest challenges and I don't think I've cracked that it's a very difficult notion to sort of a lot of the students got it completely you know straight away that's a visualization and this is a kind of analogy of a beach um, but for somebody um, with, with, with on the autistic spectrum really struggled with that and so we had to sort of build some scaffolding around it so yeah loads of different things it didn't work well all the time for sure I think it's really interesting just to hear some of the things that haven't worked perfectly. <laughs> well, everything, like it's just, yeah, definitely experimentation and, and being reflective and being okay with making errors and, you know, working with your students and having them work with you to say, I liked what you did, but it didn't quite connect. I didn't, it didn't quite, I didn't quite get it. <laughs> That's fine. You know, I can go back and fix it. There's enough time in any curriculum plan, I think, in, certainly in my world, that we can go back and work something else out we we have had a couple of other presentations about ecology field trips um one was from dom henry at hull and the other one was from heather sugden and zara marsham mm. at Arsenal. and i know that they use some free software uh, i think it's called thing links yeah um which worked really well but uh, mm. david bryson said you can do 360 degree and hotspot links in uh, h5p.org using wordpress plugins so maybe something for you to do. Definitely, well. definitely. It's the next job. <laughs> uh, Ian, did you want to unmute and ask your question? Because it's 
Thank, thanks, Nigel. Brilliant talk. Thank you. It's lovely to hear the kind of humble way you presented those ideas, um, particularly like the idea of in the world of digital saturation, the appeal of a bucket of sand or equivalent. Um, I'll try and wrap in two people's questions in one, conscious of time. Just for any of the activities, kind of interested in how you kind of presented it to the students, what they did before and after and during, you know, the kind of asynchronous, synchronous balance, um, you know, how you how they used the field trip, for example, you know, how you instructed them to interact with it. and Yeah. Things. Yeah, so it was definitely a blend, um, and all the way through these modules, we had a, a blended approach um, between. Uh, and even when we were in lockdown, you know, it was um, a blend of um, pre-learning content. Uh, so looking at and also linking to uh, locations that we had been, because some of these students had been on campus and on field trips, so we could draw their experiences and have them paint their own pictures so we did we had some sort of we did a lot of pre-learning around um uh, around the kind of developing the the theories that would allow me to directly teach them so the the virtual tour i taught so it wasn't a piece of asynchronous learning it was a it was a workshop session so i could guide the sort of field trip just electronically um so we had lots of conversations about um you know the practical the practicalities of it we i kind of embedded videos that we could sit and look at uh um what did we look at things like conservation grazing methods and things like that um pre-learning was really getting them to think about what they knew already about the habitats and the species so we had them doing um kind of i quite like uh just using simple quick kind of padlets um but having them pick images that they'd taken because we tried we do try anyway before covid to jettisoned into this sort of isolation we we were always really encouraging students to take imagery and field notebooks so we tried to suck all that in and get them to sort of again imagine themselves in that in the sites that they'd been to before with our first years it was who had not had any real opportunity to get you know pre sort of experience um then again we were doing trying to do things that they could um get to locally safely so we we were looking at the kind of neighborhoods um and mapping where sort of people felt comfortable and confident to go and of course we had to risk assess them doing that if it was part of the session um so it was a blend definite kind of a you know the I, I felt that i got most out of it when i led it but then it was there for them to play with afterwards That actually leads us quite nicely into the question that Hazel asked, which was um, if you had any problems curating such diverse content on the BLE um, to help students know where things were, how to navigate it. Did you have any tips on that? Yeah, um, I suppose one of the things we we just being reflective about how how things went. We we had um, historically we we were using a, an online classroom um uh, more experimentally before we got into covid um and it had it was it was one of the one big blue button i think was the one it was sort of embedded into our vle as standard um but it had quite a lot of limitations in terms of what you could do and what you could bolt onto it um this is just an example of of communication so we had that and staff had just about got used to that and then we as we got into i think we just as we'd come through the summer break we we were then using another uh, platform called Kaltura, uh, and it had a lot more sort of um, opportunity. So we were in this position where we had two online classrooms and, and staff with different favours. Um, and it was an interesting kind of, it's not my call, you know, but from an organisation perspective, you, we left that running for the semester with the dual kind of um, classrooms because we were asking a lot I guess this was the decision I don't know but you know you can imagine we're asking a lot of staff to to to, to pivot and it was very difficult to pivot you know again into another classroom setting um, so then it was really reliant on having a clear signposting system so that students knew because some staff use big blue button and some staff use Kaltura as a program team lead then it was we over the summer we said we've got to find a clean kind of um structure for our module pages on on moodle and historically we've been kind of mostly sort of having our own more free reign about creating sort of model module pages and we said for this 
section we need to make it just standard and we had we agreed as a program we'd standardize the view so that a student should be able to walk onto any module page and navigate themselves um for you know to it but yeah i don't think we cracked it fully i think there was you know it's it was about the clarity of um labels and talking to students you know one of the things I found is I, I'd put something together and then I thought it was completely obvious um and then uh, you know a student you know we'd have students sort of messaging me frantically saying I don't know where this is um and I rather than saying oh it's here and linking them to it I would always go back to the students and say well walk me through share your screen where it where why can't you see it and then I could work out why and I think that's when historically I used to work in in IT and I used to do a lot of like knowledge management and my view of how things are structured isn't necessarily you know my students view so I you know I used to sort of beta test with students and say have a couple of them come in and say oh that works or that doesn't work and try and fix it around that but we we did look at standardizing key information on our Moodle pages just to keep it really clear so hopefully that's a quite a long-winded way of answering the question but <laughs> great uh the last, last question was from David he said uh, one of the aspects that seems to have come to light around field trips is the social aspect of learning mm -hmm. the end of the camera traps um, gives a really nice example of that interaction so what was special about that that got the students to engage with it um I guess it was it it was a, a topic for them I mean it was you know would it have worked in in other you know in other groups of students maybe not um it was something that was maybe that maybe that's the big part of it it was it was something that they were really keen on it was the subject that they were looking for in, in their degree um and we tapped into it but we we had the the kind of online film night and we used to watch you know lots of ted talks sylvia rails brilliant stuff and all that good stuff and we got them really enthusiastic about content um and then some we were we were talking about doing ecological surveying and we started talking about camera traps and a few it was a sort of nuclei of students um and they had done a little bit of camera work and then we had them present at the film night because it seemed like a lovely thing to do for them to share their footage at film night and then that just started to grow um from there so i think really the, the kind of topic um and and it was very informal and it sort of pivoted off another project which was the film night and the sort of peer support work that they were doing um and now they do it themselves. So it's, it's moved into a totally sort of student-centered thing now. It's their own thing. That's brilliant. We've got to love this student-centered stuff. Uh, <laughs> David Bryson has given you a contact of Debbie Alston at Derby. And she does some wonderful things with wildlife eye spies. So maybe somebody oh, yeah. get in touch with them. Fabulous. Thank you so much. I appreciate that.